Feel the joy of the Lord in this place. Amen? Amen. All right. This one's new to me, but it's not to anybody else. But I just the Lord's Prayer. How can you go wrong with that, right? We're gonna get a little funky. Wanna put your hands together? Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us. As we forgive the ones who sinned against us, forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come. Let's hear it. Father, let your kingdom come. What will be done on earth as in heaven? Let be done. Right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom As in heaven, here in my heart, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us, as we forgive the ones who sinned against us. Forgive them, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let the come. It's yours. It's yours, all yours, all yours. The kingdom, the power, the glory are yours. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. Forever and ever, the kingdom is yours. It's yours, it's yours, it's yours. It's yours. It's yours. all yours. It's yours, it's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours, 
there's in heaven Let it be done right here in my heart Right here in heaven Right here in my heart Amen Father, we do give you the glory. You are our Father in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. And we wait for your kingdom to come as it comes even right now in our hearts. Uh, let it spread and we anticipate that day when you rule and reign with all glory and authority. We're going to go ahead and take an offering. Uh, you, you may be seated. If you... Uh, Count this church as your home. You like what's going on here? Uh, let this be part of your worship. It's an offering just as much as lifting up your voice, just as much as serving. Uh, so we offer it to the Lord and ask him to do with it what he will. Because it's his, right? It's his, all his, all his. So, And if you're new with us, hang back, check us out, make sure we're we're what you want to support. So you're our guest today. So uh, feel free to let it pass. Lord, we do uh, pray for this offering, that you would bless it, that it would further your kingdom, that because of the contributions today, more people would hear about Jesus, more people would be lifted up, more people would be comforted in your name. So bless this offering, Lord, in Jesus' name.
Lord, there is power in your name. Your name is wonderful. Your name is mighty. Your name is beautiful. So Lord, let us ponder on the name of Jesus. The Jesus who went to the cross and took our place for the death that should have been on us. The beautiful name of Jesus. You took it on yourself. The beautiful name of Jesus, you are in the tomb. The powerful name of Jesus, you rolled away that stone and you came, came back with us. Satisfied the wrath of the Father. What a beautiful name. Wonderful name, powerful name of Jesus. Give you all glory and honor and power. In your name, Lord, in Jesus' name.
And in the first week, we discovered that sometimes our circumstances, our situations, our crises could become so big and so overwhelming that we sometimes leave God out of the equation, making circumstances bigger than God. And last week, we discovered that sometimes our shame could actually be, become so big that it overshadows God's grace and forgiveness. And if you miss that, go online, get, get the message so you can figure out how important it is to, to know that shame can be so much smaller the bigger we know about, the more we know about God's grace and His forgiveness. Well, this morning, I want to end our series talking about uh, envy. Envy, that can become bigger than God. And we're about to read a memoir of a person we've never met. I always thought it was interesting to read people's published memoirs or diaries, and, and maybe you've read a book recently, but it's their thoughts and their heart that's poured out into this book or this memoir or this diary. Well, I thought it would be a great to read some uh, mem memoirs or diary entries that children have wrote, have written. And so I'm going to look at this first one here. It says, um, it says uh, this is from Ben, homeschool. It is not going well. My mom is getting stressed out. Mom is really getting confused. We took a break so mom can fight this stuff out. I'm telling you, it is not going good. <laughs> Don't you love the honesty? Just pure rock. Here's Kelly. He said, uh, uh, I'm Kelly, and this is my story. Once, I like I just said, once it was spring, and I was starting soccer, and one day I shot a girl in the face. <laughs> just a recap. Look at this one from Alexis. It says, woke up and changed into my uniform, and so far, so good. <laughs> I, well, how many people have actually prayed that? <laughs> yeah, I got my clothes on, so far, so good. Here's another one. Dear diary, I love cats. I can't stop thinking about it. So love it. Just what they love, they put down. And here's the last one. I think there's a monster under my bed. I'm, I am brave, so I will check it out. Update. Hold your fire. As for now, there's no monster under the bed, just a popsicle stick and a dead bug. That's what happens. <laughs> I love their honesty. I love what they write down. And especially as, as teachers or maybe parents, you say, hey, write something down. And I love that it flows from their heart. Whatever they put down, and there's no editing. They're just putting it down. They even misspelling. I love that about it. In Psalm 73, we're going to read the memoir of a worship leader. His name is Asaph. And yes, it's not one of those popular names you would have today that you want to name your kid. And he is, if you will, he's on staff as a worship temple leader. His task is to lead worship for Israel. And he starts with some encouraging words in Psalm 73. It says this, Surely God is good to Israel to those who are pure in heart. You have to hear the confidence that Asaph has that Israel is blessed to have God on their side. The verse ends with, to those who are pure in heart. A pure heart doesn't mean they're sinless. A pure heart actually means there that they're so committed to who God is. They're committed to having a relationship with them. But look at verse 2. But as for me, so he starts out kind of positive. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I nearly lost my foothold. Foothold. Did you catch that? He said the word almost and nearly. Something rocked Asaph's faith. He was on the edge of spiraling down spiritually, moving away from what is true. The first word, he writes in verse 2, is the word but. It's a sharp contrast to verse 1. Hold on. Surely God, hold on, but. You see the, you see the contrast? So why? Well, look at what he envied in verse 3. He says, For I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Is that so interesting? The word envied used here encompasses a strong emotion in which someone has a desire of some aspect or possession of an object. And it also blends with it the word jealousy. He was envious and jealous of something he didn't have. We have to understand, too, who are the wicked? Well, the wicked refers to people who are enemies of God. They reject God completely. 
So Asaph was envious of the arrogant and the wicked for what they were gaining. He thought he lost out somehow on the deal. How are, they, how are they getting everything that I should be getting? In verse 4 and 5, the ink really starts flowing from Asaph's pen. Look at verse 4 and 5. He details it out. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They are not plagued by human ills. See, the, the wicked don't seem to have any life struggles like we do. They don't have to deal with the day-to-day -day human burdens that cause stress, work, bills, and kids. You see his perspective so far of what he thinks? And their bodies, huh, they seem to be flawless, clean bill of health. And for some reason, maybe he was dealing with something that, that medically that God hadn't taken away yet. Maybe he didn't heal them. But for some reason, he pens that down and says, look, they're free from any kind of sickness. How is it so, God, that the people who are wicked, who reject you, who don't love you, are prospering that way? Why would they have a clean bill of health? It reminds me of a, uh, a, a, show, a, long, a, a long time ago, about 10 years ago, my, my wrist started flaring up. So much so that I was unable to grasp the guitar or do anything physical with my left hand. And a doctor said, well, we're going to have to go in and, and, and cut... Uh, the, the part that's open, almost like the sheet here, and it'll allow the blood to go through and you won't have this pain anymore. And I'm like, that's, that's surgery. And the whole time I was thinking, God, I'm your servant. Why would you do it to the person that I've that been used at church? Why would you do this? I was the same kind of, had the same kind of attitude that Asa had. I was asking that question. Asaph was wrestling with this question. Here it is. Why should the people who oppose God be better off than those who trust God? Look at verse 6 and 7. Therefore, because they live a stress-free life, he says, therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves, themselves with violence. From their callous hearts, comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. I love Asaph's metaphors. A necklace is a radiant and visible piece of jewelry, and their pride can be seen by everyone. They put it on. Violence covers them like a garment. It's part of their attire. It's part of who they are. They dress themselves metaphorically in that garment. If you really think about it, we dress too. Uh, for what we're about to do. We dress for workout. We put some clothes on that are too tight when we work out. And we go out to dinner. We go out with friends and we change our, 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 our wardrobe. We go to work and we change our road, wardrobe. And yes, does everybody in this room have clothes they lounge in at home? Yes. You dress for that. You dress to come to church. See, we dress intentionally for each event. And metaphorically, the wicked chose clothes of violence and added a bling of pride with the jewelry. In verse 7, it said, From their callous hearts comes iniquity. In the Hebrew, the phrase means their eyes bulge with fat. What does that mean? Everything inside of them. All this, this evil, is bulging out. It was like they, they had enough. They took it in, took it in, and now it's bulging out. And I love how he says it. It's better in the Hebrew. Their eyes are bulging out with fat because it's like everything inside them needs to come out. Interesting, the word, Asaph uses the word callous before the word hearts. You don't start out with calluses. A callus is something that develops. And eventually you don't have the same sensitivity as you used to. When I started playing guitar as a kid, pressing my fingers against these strings would hurt my fingers. Why? Because it's, it's right on the skin. They're sensitive right here. And so, but the more I play, I started developing calluses. And so now, you can see, hear a little bit more of there's something on it. If you look closely at my fingers, you'll see that there are calluses on my fingers. And also, you can see the indents of all the strings on my fingers all the time. You see, it didn't happen overnight. And I like how Asaph said it. They became callous. These evil, these wicked people became callous. In other words, at some point, they had guilt what they were doing. 
And then guess what? It became insensitive to it. It became callous. And it just, and now it doesn't mean anything to them. There's no guilt anymore. Look at verse 9. The mouths, their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. What is he saying? Well, in other words, they speak and act as if they're if they own the earth. They become the authority, and therefore they take liberty to abuse all who come their way because they think they have the authority. In verse 10, therefore their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance. You see, Asaph is saying that they actually have followers on Twitter and Instagram. That's what's happening here. And I like how the Message Bible renders verse 10. I like this better. It says, people actually listen to them. Can you believe it? Like thirsty puppies, they lap up their words. Their peace, their followers. They eagerly drink in what these wicked people have to offer. They're being indoctrinated by their beliefs. And what doctrine? Well, look at verse 11. They say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? Do you see how the, the wicked mock God? These people were indoctrinating those who were following them with the idea that God has no idea what's happening, or, nor does he care. In verse 12, it says, This is what the wicked are like, always free of care. They go on amassing wealth. This is what Asaph was wrestling with, everybody. God, why are you allowing them to be rich when they're living caref a carefree life and mocking you? Here's what he's dealing with, wrestling with, but this is how it's impacting him spiritually. Look at verse 13 and 14. Is everybody still good? Say yes. yes. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. I have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I have been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. Did you hear a spiritual struggle? God, am I following you in vain? It, it seems, is it getting more hollow, God? Is it, is there something in the end? Is, is, is something better than this? Because they have all the life and I don't have the life following you. Man, is he struggling spiritually? Have you ever been there? Have you ever wanted to just say, hey, uh, God, living for you doesn't seem what it should be. And it's not working. But every time I say that to myself, I realize how much I'm comparing to other people. Every time, God becomes smaller. In fact, he said, it's taking a toll on him every day. It's tearing him up inside. It was consuming him, and it's becoming bigger than God. In verses 15 and 16, you can read this later. Uh, I want you to understand what's happening when he reads. He goes, he's actually pondering. He's actually pondering, going into the temple, leading, ready to lead worship, grabbing the mic and say, hey, I just have to share something with all of you before we worship God, is that, you know, I'm not sure it's real anymore. I I'm wondering if what we're doing is in vain. He was pondering that in verses 15 and 16. Can you imagine that? And, and, and the Bible says that he actually was more afraid of, hey, you know what? I'm pondering it, but I'm thinking of the younger generations that will listen to what I'm saying and say, what is he saying? Hold on, I thought God was real. But he was worried about that. He didn't do it. But man, he's in a tough spot, isn't he? If he's ready to tell his church, you know what? God isn't real anymore. I'm not sure we should follow him anymore. It's hollow. Look at all these wicked people. Look at all these people who don't know God. They seem to be fine without them. What are we doing with them? Would that mess us up if I came out and said that? And you'd be like, oh, hold on, hold on. Something happens in verse 17. Now catch this. It says this, Till I entered the sanctuary of God, then I understood their final destiny. He has this epiphany. Something shook him at his core. He woke up. There was something that changed his perspective when he entered the sanctuary. And maybe he was preparing for worship and he remembered who God is. Maybe it was seeing the community, the community of believers like this who, that encouraged them. Hey, there's more people that actually believe this too. Sometimes the best remedy, everyone, for a difficult season in life is to worship. 
It's the last thing on my mind sometimes. But do you ever think about that? Whatever you're going through, whatever trial you're going through, whatever season of life, and you're like, God, you're beginning to look a little, uh, it's beginning a little bleak, God. It's hopeless. That's the time to worship. That's the time to pray. There are two things that woke up, woke Asaph up. The first thing, he remembered their destiny. He remembered their destiny. And in verses 18 to 20, we're not going to read those. You can go back and read those. Asaph remembers that God will set the wicked in places that will make them stumble and fall. God doesn't have a relationship with them because he rejected them. God has a plan for them. They were mere like, they were like mere fantasies. In other words, like they never were there. That's what Asaph is saying. And let's remember this, that it's God's job, not ours. It's above our pay grade. He'll take care of it. That's what, brought, that's what he needed to remember. He remembered, oh yeah, God, I remember the destiny, and you take care of it. My daughter, uh, Emily, was in a co-ed soccer team. And we're sitting in the bleachers, and, and uh, she was ready to go for a goal. And I see one of the opponents, a male opponent, come and slide tackle her right before. I mean, just took her out, and she was down on the ground. And I'm waiting for the, I'm waiting for the whistle. And Big Daddy didn't hear it. So Big Daddy stands up in the bleachers. Hey, what put a whistle on that? You know, and she was still down. I went around the field, but he came around the field. And then the ref finally... Blows the whistle, and it, sound, it felt like eternity after that she was down on the ground. He goes and checks out my daughter. My daughter gets up, and then he starts walking toward the bleachers. And I'm like, is he coming toward me? And I realize that everybody in the bleachers moved away from me. <laughs> and I'm realizing that my wife has also moved away from me. <laughs> I had to cover my Jesus Live shirt as he's walking over. <laughs> But I realized he was coming to me, and you never, never feel that nervousness because he's so far away, and he's getting bigger and bigger in your eyesight, and you're at the bleachers, and I'm just feeling nervous. I'm like, what is he going to say to me? What is, I, am I bigger than he is? I can take him. All those things come to your mind, right? So he comes closer, and he said it with such poise. He looks me in the face, and he said, hey, I'm the ref. I need you to sit down on national leave. And I'm like, and I didn't say anything, and he goes, this is my job. And he laughed, and, and, and I'm like, wow, I'm going to key his car after <laughs> My friends, when it comes to the wicked, that's not our job. God is the referee. God will, there's some things we can do for the wicked. We have a justice system, but there's some things we can't do. And that is God's job. That's not ours. Our job is to live for us. That's our job. That's our passion. You don't want to see me at a soccer game anymore, do you? <laughs> That's the first thing that woke Asaph up. He remembered the destiny. The second thing that woke Asaph up, Asaph up he remembered his destiny. Look at verses 23 and 26. Yet I'm always with you. I love it. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is my strength and my heart and my portion forever. Asaph remembered his destiny included that God is always with him. He'll never leave him, never desert him. He has the wisest counsel at the fingertips, at his fingertips. In verse 24, the phrase, you will take me into glory, doesn't mean heaven. It's more translated like this. You will receive me in glory, meaning this. God, you'll guide me through these troubles so that at the end you'll put me in a place of honor. I love the last part of that passage. That God understands that his heart and flesh may fail, but God is his strength today and in every season of his life. He has everything he needs with God the Father. You see, 
Asaph's envy was getting smaller and smaller as he remembered the truth about how big God is. In verse 28, share the last of Asaph's entry for his memoir. He says this, but as for me, personal, as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge, and guess what? I want to tell of all your deeds. I love that. He came full circle from verse 1 and all those verses in between. Surely God loves Israel and, and blesses them. And then he goes, but for me, hold on. And then he goes full circle all the way back and he says, that, you know what? I get it. I get it now. God, you are the greatest gift I can ever have. I, I realize, he realized that God is matchless, that he's not going anywhere. He's in his grip. And in verse 28, I love this, he's going to tell the world about it. I have to tell somebody about it. That, yeah, I might have that struggle, but guess what? God is still big. Even when I make him small, God is still big. Even when you think God doesn't love you, his love is always there. Even when you think his grace is this big, he, his grace is way bigger. It's immeasurable. And even when we think this world is going to pot, God is still in control. He is. He created it. And guess what? There's going to be a time, the promised time of us being with him. This is just, we're just sojourners, everybody. We're just sojourners here. This is not our place of rest. But we need a strength, don't we? Let me give you uh, four thoughts to remember from this passage. Everybody still good? First thing to remember, it's okay to pour out your frustrations of what you're wrestling with before God. Don't you like, every time I come across a passage where you have somebody reading, you're reading their memoirs and they're writing down what's on their heart, if you ever go through the Psalms, everybody, it's an amazing thing because you'll see frustration pouring out. You'll see depression pour, uh, uh, flowing out of some of these, these people who are penning these, these letters. And it's just an encouragement to me, like, hold on. You know, if they can be that honest before God and say, God, I'm struggling with this, we should be that honest with God. God, I'm doubting you. You know, we have to stop thinking that there's this lightning bolt going to come down or that he, he doesn't love us because we're saying we doubt him. No, he knows exactly where we are. And I think it's it us giving his heart. Just like those diaries we read with the kids, we need to be that raw, that open. It doesn't matter if it's jumbled sentences. It doesn't matter. Just tell him your heart. God, I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated in my marriage. I'm frustrated with my bills. Our God, I'm doubting you now because I don't know what my next step professionally is. Whatever the case is, you bring before God and say, God, I'm losing hope here. Pour out your heart. And I love that Asaph did that. He's a model to us. The second thing you remember is this. Instead of focusing on what you don't have, remember what you do have. This is a dangerous slope to constantly be comparing your life with someone else's life. And it's easy to let comparing turn into envy or jealousy. God, look at their life. And hey, we can do this within the church. Well, whoa, whoa, why is God, why is that uh, why is that family member, that Christian over there? Why is he doing it? He gets all that and I just keep on I'm having a hard time going to the job and he gets a job in an hour. How does that work, God? And you know what? That's when you start comparing. That's when the envy gets in. That's when the jealousy gets in. That's when we got to stop. Our kids uh, grew up in Agora and Southern Simi Valley. Uh, my wife and I lived in Agora before it became affluent. Uh, in other words, the big houses and stuff like that. And although that we lived there, it doesn't mean our salaries became like everyone else's around us. And the hardest part for my daughters, I thought, was that I was, we were raising them in an affluent area when we, in fact, weren't affluent. And I think part of it is that, too, is that they would go on these vacations with their, this is why I don't even camp with them. I don't camp with them one time with my daughters, but realized that all the vacations they went on with their friends was like Hawaii and all these extravagant, and it's not bad. You know, we get into a tent and they're like, Dad, where's, where's the room service in here? I mean, come on. Does this get Wi-Fi? But the thing is, I realized it, it must have been so difficult for them 
Because it's like, look, everybody else gets this and this and this. And we don't have the money to do this and this and this. And I even realized some of the parenting, just like any teen would say, it's like, you know what? When I went over to their house, their, their parents let them do this. They start comparing. Oh, yeah, and you know what? Their dad is really cool because he does this. And I, I start getting like, well, I, I think I'm cool. I mean, I was going to beat that rap up. You know? I think I was cool. <laughs> but you see where it gets? They start focusing on what they didn't have rather than what they do have. My friends, we can't let envy or jealousy get to a place where it just starts mulling in us and just in our heart and it's saturated in there. Because guess what? That's when it becomes deeper and deeper and it's harder to, God just becomes smaller. The third thing is this to remember. Envy doesn't have borders. What do I mean by that? You can be envious or jealous about anything or anybody. Asaph was envious of the wicked. That was his spiritual wrestling match. What are you envious and jealous of? And here's another question. How are you feeding it? Because you know what? If you have that emotion, you have to think about how am I feeding that envy? How am I putting more food in the mouth of envy and jealousy to get me to that place? We got to be careful. Fourth thing to remember, thank God for those epiphanies that wake you up. Ha. Do you remember, uh, and this goes back, do you remember, I don't even know if they have it anymore, remember that drink, Schultz? And it was just pure sugar and, and fuel octane from gas station. I mean, it was, it would wake you up. I mean, I remember taking it for the first time and just sipping on it, I mean, man, it just gives you a rush. Just constant sugar and caffeine. Everything I'm gonna give my grandkids when I'm babysitting, it's gonna be fantastic. <laughs> But it wakes you up. And we need God's jolt sometimes. We need the, that his espresso, if you will, to wake us up. And I love this about God. He knows exactly how to do it. He's going to do it different than me. He knows how to wake me up. He knows how to talk to me. He knows how to stop me in my tracks. And he knows it, what to do for all of you. Because he knows you. He knows you intimately. And guess what? How he stops you? It's not how he's going to stop me. We need this epiphany. I love verse 26. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength in my heart. He provides those wake-up calls. I'm going to wake you up, but guess what? I'm going to give you the strength through this part. I'm going to give you the strength to remember that I am God. Something happened in Asaph's heart that got him back on track. And what we don't know is how long he struggled with this. You see, you have to understand something. Asaph was just one worship leader. There were multiple worship leaders in the temple. And maybe this is stewing the next time. Maybe it was a month, or maybe it's two months. Okay, now it's my turn. And all this time, we, it we don't know. But I tell you this, it didn't happen overnight. He didn't go, oh, you know what? I just, I just ended it. No, 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 no. No, no, no. I think it started, it started mulling around his head. It started just, oh, I can't get this off my mind. He woke up. Thank God for those epiphanies. There are so many things that we face in our lives that will make God small. And I really believe, church, sometimes we need to be re reminded that God's word gives us so much a description of who he is. And how he, how he operates, his character, his attributes. But I love this too. Who would have thought you'd ever learn something from a guy named Asaph? <laughs> when you get in God's word, you're filling yourself up. And I'm hoping that our eyes will bulge with fat. But it's stuff that's, that God is doing in our hearts. Mm -hmm. The second thing is this. Being in a community of believers coming to a family like this is essential. It's beneficial for you as you walk through this. Because I like when he entered back in. And you know what? I don't know if it is, but maybe seeing everybody there anticipating, worshiping the God of gods, the King of kings, maybe that encouraged them. And he's like, oh, man, I needed that. 
Even this morning, Todd, one of our elders here, he just said something to me that just encouraged me so much. And sometimes God will use other people to give them, give you his message. Even if you're like, hold on, how do you know it? I don't know anything. I just, I just want to tell you. <laughs> I got a, a text from a friend yesterday, and he goes, Andy, I don't know why I was reading this in this passage, and, I, and God just wanted me to send it to you. And I'm telling you, verbatim, I'm like, how in the world did he know? That's what a community, a community of families. We're here to encourage each other, walk those paths. And when I come in doubt, and when you come in doubt, we're all holding each other saying, let's do it together. Let's make sure we're getting to a place where God is bigger than all of us and everything that we got. Let's pray together. God, the envy has no boundaries. It, it, we simply don't know what we'll be envious about or what we'll be jealous about. But we do know this, that it could, it could take us over. We can wrestle with this. And yet, God, you're saying, I'm, I'm bigger than this. Would, would, you, would you just look at what I've given you? The greatest gift is that I love you and I have a relationship with you. Is that enough for you? God, thank you for teaching me through the series how big you are and the things that make, that make uh, you small in my mind. <coughs> God, thank you for being mutable. Thank you for always being there, being our wisdom, our strength, and our power. And God, we look forward to the day when we see you face to face and all this will be behind us.
God our praise. You are worthy. We give you glory. Amen. Remember, we're meeting here in five minutes. Um, if you have questions that you want to ask, you're welcome to ask them on the microphone. If you're shy, there's a basket right there with some paper and pens. Write down any questions you have for Andy or the board, and uh, we'll be back here in five minutes to answer them. Thank you. It's your prayer.